Then in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our beautiful God, you brought us together again with the opportunity to pray, the opportunity to praise, the opportunity to learn, the opportunity to share, and the opportunity to participate in this wonderful devotion by which we can rescue those we care and love so much from the clutches of the one who wishes nothing but to destroy them and to enslave them. So we're grateful for the freedom that you call us to. And we pray very much that we may share this with others. We look at all the hatred and just all the pettiness, all of the misery, all of the ego that is just choking our world, the impurity. And we know we struggle with it ourselves and you have given us so much grace. How much we look around and see how great the darkness is. We know that light always vanquishes darkness. So please help us here to bring light, to spread light, to clear the darkness, to blind Satan, and to bring about holiness in the hearts of all those around us. And so as we always do, we pray to our Holy Spirit who makes this all possible, saying, come Holy Spirit, and fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and we shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O Holy Spirit, grant us all the gifts to perfect the virtues, so we may live the Beatitudes with Jesus Christ for the glory of the Father and the salvation of souls. O Holy Spirit, substantial love of the Father and the Son, uncreated love dwelling in the souls of the just, come down upon me like a new Pentecost and bring me an abundance of your gifts, of your fruits, and of your grace. Unite yourself to me as the most sweet spouse of my soul. I consecrate myself entirely to you, Invade me, take me, possess me wholly. Be the penetrating light which illumines my intellect, the gentle motion which attracts and directs my will, the supernatural energy which gives energy to my body. Complete in me your work of sanctification and love. Make me pure, transparent, simple, true, free, peaceful, gentle, calm, serene even in suffering and burning with charity toward God and neighbor. Kindle in me the fire of your love and the flame of eternal charity. And Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the Father, send now your spirit over the earth. Let the Holy Spirit live in the hearts of all nations that they may be preserved from degeneration, disaster, and war. May the Lady of all nations, Mary, co-redemptrix and mediatrix, be our advocate. Amen. Again, St. Paul, we turn to you, and we ask that you help us, aid us by your prayers, that we may, with energy like you, spread this word everywhere in all the world, regardless of whom, that all may come to salvation. And so for all of us, our families, and the whole world, we pray, for this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. And then, dear Mother, of course we ask for your aid, for you have done all this for us, to give us this great devotion, to attach to it so many great promises, and so we turn to you and pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Spread the effect of grace of your flame of love over all of humanity, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. We ask St. Vincent of Paul, please pray for us. St. Catherine of Siena, Pray for us. St. Thomas, pray for us. So, dear Lord, we again we turn to you and ask that it be you who live and speak and share and inspire all of us now by the power of your Spirit. In your name, Lord Jesus, we pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. 
Amen. So while we were praying, one of, the, one of the items that came up, a couple of folks had some questions and some comments. I thought I'd share those because those are always helpful. Uh, rather than just listening to me jabbering, what are people thinking? What are they asking? One of the questions that came up was about praying at the Hail Mary and not so much what Mary asked that we add, but the question of you or thee or thou. You know, which, which should we use? Which one is right? Because some people say you, some people say thee, some people say thou. So I thought I'd go ahead and, and address where that all comes from. That <clears throat> the two concerns that I hear people sometimes express are they want to pray it the way it is in the Bible. So if the Bible says, you know, blessed art thou among women, you know, the Lord is with thee, then that's what we should do. And it's interesting that, of course, when Gabriel spoke to Mary, he didn't speak in English. He probably spoke in Aramaic. Luke wrote it in Greek, and it was just the second person, you know, subject or object. And then it's up to the translator on how they want to translate it into English. So if we look in the Bible, it really depends on which translator you want to use. For example, here I've got the Revised Standard Version and the King James Version side by side. So you'll notice that they translated out the one, the King James Version, being an older English, says, blessed art thou among women, right? Oh, the Lord is with thee. Okay, whereas the Revised Standard says, the Lord is with you. So it's really not a matter of which one is in the Bible. The Bible would have been written in the Greek, and the Greek has to be translated into English, whichever way you wish. The other question that I sometimes hear is we want to use the more respectful form of address. You know, thee and thou being more, more formal than you. And that's kind of interesting, too. And again, if someone knows better, correct me here, because I'm not an English history major or anything. But in the history of English, in Old English, which was a language none of us would really even recognize if we heard it, the second person subject and object singular were thou and thee. Plural were ye and you. So if I were speaking to one person, I'd say the Lord is with thee. If I were speaking to all of you, I'd say the Lord is with you. That changed when we got to Middle English, which is a little closer to what we speak today. And there they took away the, the singular and the plural. And basically, the became the informal form of address. You became the formal form of address. So if I were speaking to you as a dear friend, I would say the. If I were speaking to you formally, I would say you. So it's actually interesting if we had to go back to Middle English, it's just the opposite from what we sometimes think. You know, then in the 1600s, we just did away with ye. And in the 1700s, we did away with thee and thou, except in older pieces. So really, neither of those are concerns. So please feel comfortable either way. If you want to pray thee and thou, pray thee and thou. If you want to pray you, pray you. Most of all, let's not get concerned with each other, you know, depending on which one we use. But that's the history of the language and where the thee and the thou and the you have all come from. Another, uh, it wasn't a question, it was just a, almost, it was a very humorous discussion, it was kind of fun, uh, after Seneca last week, <clears throat> was on the diet changes that we mentioned, talked about blanding the diet, and someone asked about, well, it's blanding the diet, and then I also had brought up some of the practices of the saints, where they actually put things in their food, right, St. Francis putting ashes in his food, and I spoke about, you know, putting in garlic, in fact, I have, I've been eating tons of garlic, so you may want to stay away from me, I've got this, this cold, so <laughs> it keeps everything away, including people. Uh, or, or other things. And there are really two different things. Blanding is when we take stuff out to make it tasteless. And this other practice is putting stuff in to make it taste lousy. But the bottom line is still the same. The idea that we use our eating as an offering in love for the salvation of others. So I just want to clarify that. And then it was kind of cute. Someone said they stuck some garlic in their ice cream and then it tasted so bad they threw it out. And the other person said, oh, see, you chose to fast instead. <laughs> and it is interesting how, how attached we are to food, right? We find sometimes we'd almost rather fast than eat that which doesn't taste good. So it's an interesting perspective on this, on this particular devotion. Um, but now, as I mentioned, that we're more than halfway through our introduction now, that we're starting to come to some of the more challenging parts of the devotion. And perhaps the most physically challenging part of the devotion to the flame of love are the night vigils. So I thought that that would be our topic for today. Um, they are perhaps the most physically challenging, but they also are some of the most important, and they come with remarkable promises attached to them. Notice this statement from Mary as she speaks to Elizabeth. 
Elizabeth writes, while praying before dawn, the Blessed Virgin spoke with me about the effect of grace of her flame of love. Right? This is what we pray, you spread the effect of grace of your flame of love. She's praying before dawn, right? So it's nighttime. Mary says to her, from today on, <clears throat> when you, together with the person designated to you as companion, are in vigil, to you who already know my flame of love, I will grant the following grace. As long as your night vigil will last, my flame of love will act upon those who are dying throughout the whole world. I will blind Satan so that my flame, gentle and full of grace, will save them from eternal damnation. Wow, what a promise. What's, what's the value of that? You know, to take all of those who are dying. I, mean, I, I often pray for those who are dying right now because for them, there is no tomorrow. There's no further opportunity. This is it. Should they choose hell, that's their eternal choice. Should they choose heaven, this is their eternal choice. There is nothing beyond this. They are at the most important moment of their entire lives. To have the opportunity to bring them to salvation is extraordinary. What a great promise associated with this challenging physical practice of the vigils. In some of your notes, it's incorrect. It's actually not from Fatima, but several mystics have talked about souls falling to snow like hell. The children of Fatima these did see souls falling to hell. They just didn't compare it to snow. Other mystics have, and others have said it's not like snow. It's like a pouring rain. There are so many going in so fast. But sometimes you misunderstand that. So if someone is falling into hell. Are they there yet? No. Right? If I'm falling to the ground, am I on the ground yet? No, if you catch me, I don't hit the ground. So it is for those who are falling into hell like snowflakes, they're like a pouring rain. If we catch them, they don't land there. And this is the incredible opportunity that Mary is giving us by this great grace she is associated with the night vigils of the devotion to the flame of love. That I will blind Satan so that my flame, gentle and full of grace, will save them from eternal damnation. Later on, she says, You see, my little one, once the flame of love of my heart lights up on the earth, its effective grace will also spread out to the dying. Satan will be blinded. And through your prayer at the nighttime vigil, our prayer at the nighttime vigil, the terrible struggle of the dying against Satan will end. I don't know what goes on there, but I know we pray about it all the time, right now and at the hour of our death. St. Faustina would talk about how important the hour of death is, that remarkable things happen. But there also seems to be a challenge. I have heard of people who, mentioning as they were dying, you know, this terrible assault of Satan that was upon them um, before they either recovered or passed, trying to make them doubt that it's all in vain. She says, through your prayer at the nighttime vigil, the terrible struggle of the dying against Satan will end. Coming under the gentle light of my flame of love, even the most hardened sinner will convert. In fact, someone had asked, well, what about free will? We're saying they're going to be saved because of our nighttime vigil, but isn't it their choice? And indeed it is. Was it Sister Lucia who said that no one goes to, no, God doesn't send anyone to hell. Anyone who goes there chooses it. So there is free choice and there is free will, and sadly some may choose hell. But it's interesting the way it's phrased here, that by this flame of love, even the most hardened sinner will convert. I can't imagine that when anyone fully understands, when they stand in complete freedom and truth, when Satan is blinded and the demons are, are dazed and not influencing them, and they understand all things as they are and they see it all, why in the world would they not choose heaven except for excessive pride that makes them say, I don't care, I'm still not going to submit. And what's the antidote to pride? Grace. Grace destroys our pride to take us from the blinding pride to the liberating humility of God. And so if we bring about this great grace, here's the opportunity to take away that one thing that can make people choose hell, their pride. So a beautiful thing that Mary has done for us that we can participate in by these vigils. Even later on, Mary says, <clears throat> My little one, 
I ask you again to give immediately your confessor the instructions on how to make the night vigils united to the merits of my divine son. Right, so when we do this, it's not us. It's because we're united to the merits of Jesus. You have not yet given these to him. I want the holy night vigils by which I want to save the souls of the dying to be organized in every parish so there is not even one moment without someone praying in a vigil. This is the instrument that I place in your hands. By this, you and your companions will save the souls of the dying from eternal damnation. By the light of my flame of love, Satan will remain blind. Oh, this is just extraordinary. In fact, this is why we, we hopefully will continue building up our opportunities to do vigil. Uh, there is a prayer line that, uh, that we have. It's actually not a flame, flame of love. It's from an organization called CMD, but they use the flame of love rosary. And I think we do have some business cards around here that have the times. If you're interested in that, they do pray the, the flame of love rosary at midnight, at six in the morning, at noon, and at six in the evening. And maybe hopefully one day we'll have enough people interested that we can create a continuous flame of love rosary where people dial in any time of the day or night that we can do what Mary asks here, that there's not even one moment without someone praying in vigil. That you and your companions will save the souls of the dying from eternal damnation. That is just extraordinary. So what is it? What are these night vigils that, are, that have such great power? What is it that we are asked to do? <clears throat> Early on, Jesus said to Elizabeth, let your sacrifices always be fervent. I would like to increase my graces in you, right? Increase my life in you, or the things that I do in you. Increase my graces in you. However, to do that, I need greater acceptance of sacrifices. Accept my plea, be very humble, and renounce every pleasure which does not serve me. You must renounce more of your sleep. I ask you for two hours of prayer so that you have to get up twice every night for one hour. My beloved, can I count on you? I, the man God, ask this of you. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was pretty keen on those promises, but this is, this is, this is a lot. This is hard. This is tough. Two hours every night? Oh, man. And it is hard. It's very hard. In fact, Elizabeth struggled with this. She writes, I found the nightly vigil very difficult. To rise from sleep cost me much. I asked the Blessed Virgin, my mother, I beg you, wake me up. When my guardian angel wakes me up, it's not, so, not effective enough. And I, I really laugh, I think. <laughs> she wants the Blessed Mother to wake her up instead of the guardian angel. I'm stuck with an alarm clock. <laughs> You know, but, but actually not. I'll talk about that a little later on. But, you know, I do, I do find that interesting. But she is struggling with it, right? And she asked the Blessed Mother to wake her up, not even a guardian angel. And the next night, the Blessed Virgin awakened me, right? So she, she does. I wanted to get dressed because I did not think it was respectful to speak with the Blessed Virgin while I lay in bed. But the time for the vigil had not yet arrived. It was just midnight, not 2 a.m., the Blessed Virgin said, stay in bed, my little one. This is not lack of respect. A mother can speak to her daughter any place and any time. Listen to me. I beg you, do not let your mind be distracted during the night vigil, as it is an extremely useful exercise for the soul, elevating it to God. Make the required physical effort. I also did many vigils myself. I was the one who stayed up nights while Jesus was a little baby. St. Joseph worked very hard so we would have enough to live on. You should also be doing it that way. Even on Sunday, your day of rest, you will do vigils and attend as many masses as possible. Okay? But it's hard. Elizabeth found it hard. It's very hard. Earlier on she says, Lord, <laughs> I usually sleep deeply. What if I cannot wake up to keep watch? And Jesus replied, I'll help you with that as well. If there's anything too difficult for you, confidently tell our mother. She also spent many nights in prayer vigils. 
And the Lord Jesus promised to give me a special strength for the nightly prayer because I am already exerting all possible effort. <clears throat> he promised that he would wake me up. What happiness fills my soul to experience his presence when he awakens me. The night prayer goes so quickly in his presence. While I was joined in union with him, something special happened. And then Elizabeth goes on to describe Jesus actually walking outside the house and blessing her house for her. You know, so it is hard, but Jesus says he'll help. But still, it's hard. Much later on, she writes, while it was almost dawn, but still night, the Blessed Virgin said, my little one, I see that because of your great pains, you cannot rise for the nighttime adoration. She just couldn't. And there'll be days where our body will say, nope, not tonight. It's not going to happen. All right? All right? I see that because of your great pains, you cannot rise for the nighttime adoration. In spite of that, you must regain all your strength. When you wake up, you will offer your sorrowful vigil for the dying. I mean, even Satan mocks how hard the vigils are. Elizabeth writes that during the day, the evil one laughed mockingly. Listen, listen, I wanted to open your eyes to make you set aside your foolishness. Enough of this fasting and nighttime vigils. Leave it all behind. It makes no sense at all. You know, so Satan is so intense to mock her and to discourage her from doing this. You can imagine how powerful these nighttime vigils are against him and what grace they bring. So why are the night vigils so effective? Why are they so effective? Well, for one, it's the time that Jesus especially seeks souls. Elizabeth writes, on June 2nd, the sweet Savior awakened me for the nightly prayer with these words, in the quiet of the night, I seek souls. In the quiet of the night, I seek souls. Let whoever might one day read these lines not take it badly that once more I have to indicate that I was in tears. His tenderness and attention filled my eyes with tears. Then he said, since this so pleases you, from now on when I awaken you, these will be my words. In the quiet of the night, I seek souls. From these words, I knew that his eternal thought is to seek souls. Right? May our hands gather in unity. It's a unity prayer. And what are we gathering? Souls, he tells us. Souls. From these words, I knew that his eternal thought is to seek souls. Why did he make us? He didn't make us to throw us away. He didn't make us to be damned. He didn't make us to go to hell. He made us to be saved. He came to save us. His eternal thought is to seek souls. A little later on, Elizabeth writes, I was sick. For days I could not pray because I was so weak. When I felt a little stronger, I firmly resolved to return to prayer at night. I asked Jesus, my adored Jesus, give me strength. At 3 a.m., the Lord awakened me by his presence and his words. And Jesus said, in the loneliness of the night, I seek hearts. In the loneliness of the night, I seek hearts. Why else is it so effective? It's also so effective because in those long stretches of the night, we have that time, that unencumbered time to be intimate with God without distraction. I don't know if any of you have had the the uh, opportunity <laughs> or, or difficulty of having to work all-nighters. You know, when there are deadlines to meet or whatever it is, and you wind up working all through the night. And it's amazing how much you can get done working all through the night when there are no emails and phone calls and distractions and meetings and this and that and the other thing. And so it is with our prayer. You know, how often we pray, but we're thinking, oh, I've got to get to this, I've got to get to that, I mean, we've got to finish this rosary because Mass is about to start. We've got to get over with Mass because I've got to get out to the doctor or to the store, or I've got to get to work. Whatever it happens to be, you're praying and you're thinking about what you've got to do this day and the shopping you've got to do and the tasks you've got at work and what's going on with the kids or husband or wife or whatever it might be. 
And there are all these distractions. Whereas at night, you just have the time to be with our beloved. And as Elizabeth says, it goes so quickly. You know, again, just my only own personal experience, I often find for the last several months that I'm not even getting up twice because I get up, I start to pray, and maybe I spend a little time meditating on the five wounds and praying about that and praying about the dying, and maybe it's around three in the morning praying for those who worship Satan because that's the satanic hour of mockery, three o'clock in the morning to mock the three o'clock in the afternoon death. Maybe pray a divine mercy chaplet for them. And, and often I like to do matins. I like to pray the office of readings. And you know, just by the time, instead of just getting through them, to actually take the time and dwell in the words of the Psalms, to carry on a dialogue. What do you mean by that? What about this? What about that? Oh, I see what you mean by this. You're so wonderful. Yeah, it's just, as you take the time to do that, I look and suddenly I look at my watch and two hours are gone. You know, to just even pray five decades of the rosary, but just being so immersed in them and dwelling in the mystery, two hours are gone. It just flies by. But to have that time to really dwell in them. I mean, even here, even here when we pray, maybe hopefully folks don't mind, maybe hopefully they're not offended, but you know, I encourage everyone in the rosary to, to pray your heart when we're praying it. There's no great rush. We don't have to, have to race through it. You know, what are our thoughts? What is our engagement? When in RCIA, as I mentioned, when I'm teaching people the rosary, it's, it's the family gathered around the table. You picture yourself, you're playing, praying the rosary, and there's the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. There's Mary, there's St. Joseph, there's your guardian angel, there's Gabriel, there's Michael, there's St. John the Baptist. You know, all together, reliving these mysteries, being in these mysteries, these events. And I tell them, engage them. And usually what happens is we start praying like that, and they'll, they'll turn to me. And they'll say, oh, I wonder what Mary was thinking about that. And they'll say, well, go ask her. She's here. She's not in the next room. <laughs> you know? Go talk to her. Go thank her. Gabriel, what was it like when you bring that message? What were the other angels thinking? You know? Just be engaged. And suddenly that time just, just vaporizes. But that's that intimacy. That's the closeness that God wants. Right? We're the bride of Christ. That means we need to be intimate with him. We need to be close with him. Not always talking about him in the third person like he's in the next room over. Do that at night. Do that in the night vigils. You know, put your head on his shoulder. Just dwell in his arms. Just be with him, with our Blessed Mother, with the Father, with the Holy Spirit. It's a wonderful time. It's a beautiful time. It's a grace-filled time because you're his and he's yours, and it's just it's your dedicated time. Very early on in the diary, Elizabeth account, recounts this being at a celebration of Our Lady of Lourdes. And so at the celebration, she noticed that there were all these people who were attending the celebration of Our Lady of Lourdes. And she turns to Jesus and prays and says, Are you happy, dear Jesus, about all these devout souls who have come to you? And he replied in a sad tone of voice, a sad tone of voice, yes, but they are in such a hurry. They do not give me time to grant them graces. When we have that time through the night, we're there, we're not looking at the watch, we're not thinking about how late it is or how early it is or what it is. The time just stands still. We're not in a hurry. And in that time, God can flood us with graces. Again, this is the flame of love. We're called to love God for all eternity. What will we do? We will love God. You can't love in a hurry. You can't establish a relationship in a hurry with a few emails, a text here and there, and a wave high and by. You can't love in a hurry, not real love. So these are what the night vigils do to us. They give us the space and the time to be rapturously in love with our beloved. Now again, the idea of the night vigils is nothing new. That's the wonderful thing about this devotion. It's not anything new. It's Mary saying, let's go take all the things that you always knew you're supposed to have, the things the early church did, as it was alive with the Holy Spirit, and do them because now we need them while we're under this attack. It's nothing new at all. Jesus himself, God in the flesh, kept night vigils. Let's go to Matthew 14 and verse 23. 
And I'll put away this King James. We'll go just back to the Revised Standard here. Matthew 14, verse 23. After he dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. So it's evening, right? But the boat goes out. The disciples are out in the boat, and they go out onto the ocean. They're being held up by the waves. And in verse 25, in the fourth watch of the night he came. Now, I'm not entirely sure, but I think the fourth watch was three to six in the morning. So he's in there, he's praying in the evening, and he's not coming back until three to six in the morning. He's kept vigil through the night. We see this again, Luke 6 and verse 12. In these days he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. So Jesus himself kept vigil. And Jesus himself was sometimes tired. Remember, it's, it's, it's Matthew 8, verse 32. You know, the, the disciples are in the boat, and the storm is coming, and they're concerned the whole boat is going to capsize, and they're going to be drowned. And where's Jesus? He's asleep. You know, he's, he's dead tired. You know, so, yeah, he gets tired. And the woman in the well, he's tired. He sits at the well. But he also kept vigil. But not just Jesus. We recently observed the Feast of the Presentation, Right? The Feast of the Presentation, we have two characters who are in the temple, important, embracing Jesus, right? One is Simeon. Who's the other one? Anna, right? Anna, this, this old widow. And how is she described? Let's look at Luke 2 and verse 37. Right? She was a widow till she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. Sound familiar? That's what we're being asked to do, fasting and prayer, night and day. This is what Anna did. But not just Anna. <clears throat> the whole church, when the church is under attack, what does it do? Let's take a look at this from the earliest church, Acts 12. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword, right? First of the apostles to be martyred, he was beheaded. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. All right, so now Peter is in jail. And it's night, so Peter was kept in prison. But earnest prayer for him was being made to God by the church. And we remember the story, right? So it's night. That very night, he's sleeping in between the soldiers and the chains. So it's the middle of the night, right? And the angel comes and the chains drop and the doors just open and he walks out into the city. He thinks he's having a vision. And then the angel leaves and he realizes that it's real. And so he goes back to where the church is meeting. And is everybody asleep in the middle of the night? No. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. And then it's kind of funny, right? He knocks on the door, Rhoda, the servant, goes. She sees him. She's so happy, she leaves him outside. forgets to open the door and goes inside to tell him that Peter's here. And they say, oh, it must be his ghost or his spirit or something, right? Or his angel, rather. And then they, they, they let him in. But what is the church doing when it's under attack? It's keeping night vigil. What's happening to the church today? Greatest attack Satan has ever launched against society, against our families, against the church. What should we be doing? Fasting and prayer night and day, the night vigils. <clears throat> Not just the earliest church, but early Christians after that. Didn't forget this. We've forgotten this. And Mary is saying, bring it back. We need it. This is a letter, an excerpt from a letter of St. Cyprian to Pope St. Cornelius. And he learns of the persecution that Pope St. Cornelius is undergoing and knows that it's coming his way. This is around 253 AD. And Cyprian writes to Cornelius, God's merciful design has warned us that the day of our own struggle, our own contest, is at hand. By that shared love which binds us closely together, we are doing all we can to exhort our congregation to give ourselves unceasingly to fasting, vigils, and prayers in common. 
These are the heavenly weapons which give us the strength to stand firm and endure. They are the spiritual defenses, the God-given armaments that protect us. So the church is under attack, and what's it doing? Fasting, night vigil, prayer. Does that sound like our Christianity today? No. If it doesn't, maybe our Christianity needs to change. This was the Christianity of the early church. That's the beauty of this devotion. It's not a condemnation of this mediocrity we have in our pews and the lukewarmness we have in our pews. pews. That's, that's a problem, right? The, church, the letter to the church of Laodicea in Re Revelation, right? That more that you are hot or cold because you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of your mouth. But I honestly don't think it's because people don't want to. Some people don't. But they don't know. They just don't know. How many, have, how many have heard of keeping night vigils? How many have heard of fasting multiple times during the week? How many have heard of blanding and defiling their food so that it becomes an offering? How many have heard of pouring out their lives and their sufferings for others? You know, it's, it's, it's like a joke that we heard from our grandmothers offer it up. You know, it's been gone for so long. And now... Mary isn't saying, ah, oh, they're hopeless, they're a mess, I don't like them, they're so lukewarm. Instead, she's saying, let's bring them this devotion so that they can come to life again, so that they can know again. They want to be fervent, no one's just telling them, so now let's tell them. Let's encourage them, let's open up their eyes to see how great a grace God can bring about in our lives if we do those things that bring grace. And one of the powerful ones is the night vigil to give us that time for God to pour out his graces into us, that intimacy to be together, to be conformed, to be as one. If that's not our Christianity, then our Christianity needs to change. Now, honestly, we do need to be both realistic and trustingly brave. This is hard. And sleep is important. We're finding out more and more how important sleep is. Right? Lack of sleep can do all kinds of things. It can excessively it can lead to heart damage. It can lead to brain damage. All kinds of things that will happen when we don't have enough sleep. So just like we said with fasting, we need to live within our limitations. But at the same time, let's not use that as an excuse. Like we said there's a thin line between faith and foolishness. There's a thin line between wisdom and cowardice. So be both realistic, but also be trustingly brave to see what can we do. Later on in the diary, again, Elizabeth writes, It hurts me so much, my adored Jesus. It hurts me so much that because of tiredness, I cannot pray tonight for the souls of the dying. It just wasn't going to happen, right? But you see in my soul my great desire to do so. In my great pain, he consoled me with these words. I accept your soul's great desire, which you offer for the dying. Yes, I will grant this also in favor of the souls of the dying. I was calmed and went to bed. During the night, I woke up often, and I immediately began to implore for the dying. However, I did not have the strength to get up to pray. During the same night, the Lord Jesus assured me that he accepted my desire to keep vigil, as he expressed it himself. So it is hard, but it's also an opportunity. I mean, there's the, the promises attached with this. We might say, well, but other people are keeping vigil, aren't they? Oh, yeah, maybe, but what if God has wake, awakened you just at this time to fill the gap that for some reason everybody stopped five minutes ago and no one's going to start for five minutes from now? You know, and he needs you in these five minutes. But more importantly, again, it's not a matter of what do I have to do. What Jesus has done is given us the opportunity to participate in the salvation of souls. Yes, he can do it entirely alone. But what wonder and what joy that he has given us the opportunity to do this, 
to participate in the very salvation of the dying to the point that, like Elizabeth says, when she couldn't, it was literal pain to her because how much she wanted to, to participate in the salvation and the life of Jesus. This is the unity prayer. Right? We say it's not something we pray, it's something we live to be one with Jesus for our hearts to beat in unison, our souls to be in harmony, our thoughts to be as one, our hands to gather in unity for souls, to be one with Jesus in his work. And these vigils are when he invites us to participate in his work of saving the dying. Now, there are some practical things that I'll, I'll share. And again, each person is different. So these are just things that I have found in my own keeping of the vigils in case they're helpful. If they're not, don't worry about them. Your own body, your own life it may work differently. But I would suggest that you ask to be awakened as you go to bed, just like Elizabeth did. Right? That as I go to bed each night, I do offer the Jesus and say, here's my body, here's my soul, you take it. Let's, let's, let's put it to use 24 by 7. <laughs> you know, use it during the night. Maybe do wonderful things for the Father. Maybe drive out darkness and bring about light, even while I'm sleeping. And wake me up for the vigils, especially around three, so I can pray for those who have given themselves over to the direct worship of Satan. You know, ask to be awakened by our Lord. And then I would suggest, and again, each body is different, I would suggest to listen to our bodies and the Lord rather than set an alarm clock. Okay, and that helps us to work within our body sleep cycles. And that's important for sleep, because again, it is important to not lose too much sleep. And sleep generally runs in, in cycles. You have a kind of, it's a short cycle that releases things, receptors in your brain. But then there are these long cycles that are very, very important for our mental health, our physical health. And they tend to run about 90 minutes. Mine seem to have shortened to about 60 minutes lately, I don't know why. But they tend, tend to run about 90 minutes. And if you wake up in the middle of one of those sleep cycles, it's almost as if sleep has, had, had, had no effect on you. And so you want to avoid the scenario where you fall asleep and in the middle of a sleep cycle, the alarm clock wakes you up to keep vigil and you lose that sleep cycle, that 90 minutes. You know, then you pray and you go back to bed and then you're not f f finished with another sleep cycle yet and the alarm clock wakes you up again and you lose that one. And then you go back to bed and then the alarm clock wakes you up for work or for whatever and you lose that sleep cycle and you wind up throwing away almost all your sleep for the night and you're exhausted. So if, if you can do it, you may want to just listen to your body and you know, when you change over from those sleep cycles, you're more likely to wake up. And again, if Jesus is nudging you, or, or Mary is nudging you, or your guardian angel is nudging you, you know, and it gives you that chance to wake up at an opportune time for your body. But again, each of us is different. Some of you may need to set an alarm clock. I would suggest that you go to sleep with a desire to arise remembering the great promises that we have. Because you, know, you, you, you get that nudge in the middle of the night, and it's you know, one in the morning, two in the morning, three in the morning, and your first thought is, oh, this bed is so warm. The floor is so cold, and I'm so tired. I'm just going to pull the covers right back over and go to sleep. <laughs> you know? But if I go to sleep with that desire to arise, remembering in the quiet of the night I seek souls, that I can get up to save souls. That gives us that motivation to break through that, that warmth, through that cover, through that lethargy, and get ourselves up. But perhaps most importantly, and we'll talk about this at length next week, God willing, think of the extraordinary promises we've been given. We have the opportunity to bring salvation to all the dying, that not a single one be damned, not the most hardened sinner. Why would we not do that? Well, because we're exhausted. So if we want to do that, what do we have to do? We've got to make space for it. And so we've got to cut out everything from our lives that's not necessary in order to create the time needed to make space for such a marvelous grace. Right, so we need to get rid of the things in our life that we no longer have room for, that are going to keep us from fulfilling this mission, this opportunity. You know, I think, again, I don't watch a lot of movies, but I remember I was watching, for some reason, a movie, Pearl Harbor. And after the, the attack at Pearl Harbor, the US response was to make sure that we showed that we were still a potent force and a threat to Japan. Again, the sadness of war, that we do have to do this. But the plan was to actually put bombers on an aircraft carrier. 
so they could take the bombers close to Japan from the anti-aircraft carriers, have them take off and bomb Tokyo, kill people. But this was, you know, the war. But of course, you can't take bombers, you can't launch bombers from an aircraft carrier. They're too heavy, there's not enough runway. And so they had to literally pull everything they possibly could out of the bombers to lighten them so they could get off the, the and have the, the aircraft carriers high enough so they would actually fall off the end but not hit the water and still get up into the air. And as they're getting close, they recognize they've been discovered sooner than they thought, so they had to fly further than they thought. So even at this point, you see the people who are in charge going into the bombers and pulling out everything they possibly can to lighten these bombers. So with the amount of fuel they had, they can make it over. And they didn't have enough fuel to come back. They were going to fly, overfly Japan and hit to China and crash in China. But the thought was they had to get rid of everything that would hold them back. So it is with us in our mission. If we're going to be able to do this, fulfill this great opportunity to bring salvation to the dying by the promise of grace through Mary and from Jesus. Our part is to make room for it by getting rid of everything that's in the way. I mean, again, I hope we're always motivated by love. I never want to motivate us by guilt. But someday, you and I are going to have to stand before God. And when he says... I invited you to participate in my salvation. I invited you to save the dying by keeping vigil at night. And what did you watch on TV? What am I going to answer? What answer am I going to give my God who died on the cross to bring salvation because I wanted to watch the History Channel or National Geographic or that neat program on cheaters the other day that I did watch and I went to confession and said, no, I shouldn't have done that. You know, really? I mean, yeah, there's, there's great stuff out there. There's not so great stuff out there. I mean, if we have a choice between Monday night football and saving souls, as great as Monday night football can be, may that's why we'll have no guys come here, um, which would you choose? You know? If you had a choice between saving souls and watching the, uh, the, the home selling channel or whatever it is, or home improvements or National Geographic or whatever it is that you like to watch. Desperate Housewives of who knows what town today, I don't know what's out there. That's a choice we make. The choice is yours. Save souls or do something else with your time. And again, I hope it's not for guilt that we do that. This is the flame of love. It's for love of souls that we start throwing out everything out of our lives that gets in the way, that prevents us from being able to keep these vigils and bring about this great grace. Eventually, this became an extraordinary grace and gift to Elizabeth, a miraculous grace. She writes towards the end of her life, and the context here is interesting. Uh, Elizabeth always had great sufferings and trials. That'll be something we will talk about um, in, in several weeks. But most of the time, they were doubts. Elizabeth thinking, am I crazy? Am I, am I really hearing this? And is Mary really telling me this? Is Jesus really telling me this? The constant doubts that Satan would put into her mind. Those were her great trials. But then they changed. And Jesus said, your suffering now is not going to be struggling with all those doubts. Your suffering now is going to be a burning desire for the salvation of souls. Jesus' burning desire for the salvation of souls. And so in discussing the suffering that she had because she so much wanted the salvation of souls, she says, I do not want you to think that I am possessed by melancholy. This would go against my happy nature. Nevertheless, a silent withdrawal dominates my soul, and I feel as if I did not belong to the earth. This happened on other occasions also, but the Lord Jesus said that now it will continue until the end of my life. Since then... I have used greater surrender and greater fidelity in keeping the fast requested by the Lord as to the night vigil, which before cost me the most. Right? It's hard. Which before cost me the most. I have now doubled it. The Lord Jesus had first asked me to make one hour vigil twice. Now, by the grace of God, since the fire of charity is burning me, I have neither night nor day. All that I could do for the Lord seems so small. 
I spend each night in prayer from midnight to 5 a.m. Then I go to the church where I continue my adoration. Then at the Holy Mass of 7 a.m. I receive the sacred body of the Lord. I spend the day helping my family. All during this time, the Lord's presence fills me to such a degree that my soul is lifted above my bodily activities because my soul remains next to the Lord without any interruption. Now, I don't expect that we would get here unless God gives us an extraordinary grace like he gave to Elizabeth. But at least we can beseech him for the grace to do what he has asked. So what are our next steps? What are the practical things that we do as we, again, unpack this devotion element by element, step by step? Well, as we just discussed, we organize one's schedule. We organize one's personal daily schedule, cutting out whatever is necessary to get to bed early enough to make time for the powerful practice of the night vigils, during which we save the dying from damnation and bring about this great outpouring of grace. So we organize your schedule, cutting out whatever we can to make room for the night vigils. As we mentioned last week, to avail oneself of the sacrament of reconciliation regularly and make a daily examination of conscience. To try to attend daily mass if possible, and if possible, arrive early or stay late to spend time in adoration. Again, if possible, and it's not always possible, but if possible, to make time at a perpetual adoration chapel near your home or near your work. To continue fasting and maintaining a bland diet, using our food as an offering. Continue the family flame of love holy hours on Thursday and Friday that works in your family. Continue living Jesus' daily intentions. Continue living the unity prayer. Continue the flame of love Hail Mary and the rosary, the fivefold sign of the cross. And continue offering our work, our sacrifices, our fasts, our blanded meals, our vigils, our repentance, masses, and adoration for the blinding of Satan, the salvation of souls, our families, and the joy of our beloved. All right, so this is a hard one, but this is a powerful one. I don't know if there's anything other than mass and adoration that is as powerful as the outpouring of grace we receive when we have that time in the night vigil to be just madly in love with our God without interruption. So before we stop to pray, the most important thing we do, um, thoughts, ideas, sharings, promptings, experiences on this topic of these night vigils. All right. Then with that, let me shut this down so we, uh, we're not distracted. We can pray without distraction. And, um, and we will pray.